Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Hello, and welcome back to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I hope you and yours are doing as well as can be expected as we all navigate this topsy-turvy world we've found ourselves in. Like most of us, I've had my ups and downs over the last week, but there is one thing that today's guest mentioned during our conversation that has really stuck with me and helped, and that is accepting performance degradation. Now, performance degradation is a term used in a number of scientific fields, and it's usually used to refer to the reduction in performance of some matter or componentry, but we can flip it around and use it for human behaviour, especially right now. It's all about accepting and giving ourselves permission to not be at our best. So to not be on top of everything, to not be as efficient or as organised or even as calm as we might usually be. And I, I guess it's a alternative term for cutting yourself some slack. Just sounds a bit more official somehow. So for me, accepting performance degradation has meant giving myself permission to have days when the bare minimum gets done. My kids are officially on school holidays right now and some days we're only getting dressed in time to get outside and get some exercise in the middle of the afternoon. And the plans I've had for delivering work to clients and developing new online content and linking in with you, our community, on a daily basis have gone out the window. Not forever, just for the moment. And I'm reminding myself that that's okay. And I hope it's okay with you too. And this is all about prioritising wellbeing. So sleep and rest and movement and connection. And for me at least, and I think for probably everyone, it's accepting that it's hard to stay focused when your mind is muddled and every decision requires so many more inputs and so much more consideration than ever before. Simple things like going to the supermarket. You know, do I go now? Do I go later? Should I go at all? What do we have that we can survive on? Is this the right thing to do right now? What is the right thing to do right now? And if you're like me, you might be having those conversations with yourself on the reg, getting nowhere and deciding that you should maybe just, I don't know, check the ABC app on your phone for the latest news update or scroll Instagram for a while or just sit on the lounge and stare into space for several minutes. And that's all okay. And of course, that might not be where you're at at all right now. You might be powering through or just too busy to be thinking about anything other than what's right in front of you. And that is totally okay. In fact, it's great. I'm a little bit envious because I'm not very good at not having too much to do. I'm certainly not very practiced at it. So wherever you are right now, however you're coping, whatever you're feeling, give yourself permission to feel it and to do it or not do it. It's all okay. It's all normal. It's all human. You're doing the best that you can do and being the best that you can in a challenging, new and constantly changing situation. We are all doing exactly that. So in the spirit of doing what's necessary and allowing a bit of performance degradation, I am hitting pause on the podcast just for a few weeks after this episode. We will be back with renewed energy and new guests and new topics, possibly all related to life in the time of global pandemic. It's all going to be back in a few weeks' time. We were scheduled to finish the season shortly anyway, so we're giving ourselves a slightly early mark, and I'll tell you more about that at the end of the show. Before we go, though, I'm very excited to bring you this episode and my interview with Dr. Joe Sweeney. And you might remember Joe from a past episode of the show. He joined me to discuss the future of work and how to prepare our kids for it. And it was a really interesting, insightful interview. And today he's joining me again, this time to discuss the perks and pitfalls of working from home, a very pertinent topic for many of us right now. So let's listen in. 
I am really pleased today to have Dr. Joe Sweeney here with me. Joe is a past guest here on the Potential Psychology Podcast, having talked to us previously about the future of work and the knowledge that kids need to th- survive and thrive in that world. Joe is an industry analyst for digital workforce innovation, policy and education, and a researcher into workforce transformation. He has worked for a fully distributed or remote work from home organisation for the past 16 years and is here to talk to us about working and learning from home, something that we're all rapidly learning about from both a strategic and a practitioner's perspective. So he knows it and he lives it. Welcome back to the show, Joe. (laughs) Thank you very much. It's fabulous to have you here. I'm really glad we've had this opportunity because, as I just alluded to, we have been launched into this entire new world, newer for some than for others Mm. in terms of working from home. But now many of us have the additional challenge of trying to do that while perhaps we have partners at home also trying to work. We have children at home who are not at school and it's somewhat of a juggle. So I'm really keen to pick your brain. Right. Yeah. It, it is a challenge for a lot of people at the moment. Can I start? Perhaps just tell us a bit more about your work in this area and what you're being asked by people and organizations in terms of, you know, how do we do this effectively? Okay. So first of all, prior to the, the, the pandemic, uh, the questions around work from home were what I would call voluntary meaning your staff were coming to the HR department or the technology group and saying, I want to work from home. And interestingly, when you look over the last decade, the reasons for working from home were originally all about lifestyle and so forth. But in the last three years, that's changed globally to very much people want to be more effective. People actually recognizing that you get more done in less time when you work from home. But and there's a but to this. Most of those people, you know, that swing has happened from the people who have already started working from home in the past. They've already become efficient in this model. So there was a change happening, but it was very much a voluntary change. So organizations were looking to adopt work from home policies to keep people happy and to get that productivity dividend. What's happened now is very, very different. And I really think that we have to be careful about the challenges between those two models, this model where you have to work from home for your own safety, for the population safety. A lot of the people who are working in that environment, they don't have a proper home setup. They don't have the experiences working from home, the processes, and they may not have the discipline because the discipline of working in a quasi-isolated mode are very, very different from the disciplines that you have working with your peers. Now, I've been doing this for close to 20 years, and you know I've developed very, very specific types of disciplines. And when I read what other people have developed over that time, they're very, very similar. When you then go and look at activity-based working, I did a, a major study late last year, early this year, into new office space designs and what they look like. And surprise, surprise, a lot of them borrowed things from the best practices of working from home, such as the health issues, the mental health issues, physical health issues, and all the rest of the behavioral issues that go with it. So there isn't one model here. But what I am concerned with, and I'm deeply concerned with it, and we're taking a a lot of inquiries at the moment at IBRS, is, okay, we've forced people to work from home. What now? We Mm. aren't able to communicate with those people or they don't know how to communicate with us. They're getting social isolation. You know, who would have thought three months ago that I'd be taking a swamp of inquiries around how do we avoid social isolation for our staff? People are getting depressed. People are anxious already with the virus, but now they're getting isolated from their workmates, which represents a massive part of people's lives. So there's a lot to that question. (laughs) Where should we start? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, look, I I think, you know, the first thing that, well, one of the things that you mentioned there that really struck a chord with me, and I suppose I hadn't really thought that through, is that, yeah, a lot of people have not had previous experience with this. I worked from home almost exclusively other than when I was delivering content on, on client sites for the better part of, I think, 16 years or more, and I still do a bit of work from home. And I remember that when I first started, it took me quite a while to develop that discipline 
those habits to create some structure around my day that didn't see me either kind of procrastinating and getting distracted by household tasks during the day and then doing this kind of mad cram late at night because I hadn't managed to, you know, reach my deadlines. Uh, that behaviour model. <laughs> yes. So there was that for me. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing for me was that there was this kind of perception and, and maybe that's different now because 16 years or more is a little while ago now. But I know that, well, I believe that for a lot of my family and friends, they kind of registered instead of Ellen working from home, they just registered Ellen at home. Mm. And so I had a slew of interruptions and phone calls and do you want to go have a coffee or do you want to go shopping? Or obviously those things are out of the question for us at the moment. But the perception certainly back then was that working from home wasn't working. It was just kind of, you know, being at home instead yeah. of working. So, so look, the number one thing, when people have asked me in the past, and it is different now with, with COVID, I, I want to make a distinction here, but in the past, people have asked me, what's the most important thing for working from home? How do you make it work? And it's discipline. It's really that simple. You need discipline in a couple of areas, and they're not the areas that people normally think. The first one is knowing when not to work. And you need to have an incredibly clear demarcation between you and you are on the clock or off the clock. Even when you're working for yourself or working for a research organization like ours, that doesn't mean that you can't work late at night if that's what turns you on. But, you know, that's how you work best. Do it. <laughs> but set aside that time. The importance of that is there is a real danger for people who first start this that they think that they're going to get work-life balance, but they actually destroy it because they never switch off. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is you overwork, you start to find busy work because you unconsciously wish to find something else. So you do housework, but you're still working. You make no time to live. So that discipline is, I think, the number one. The other discipline is have an area where you work. Now, this is the thing that worries me most about the, uh, the current pandemic, um, pushing people into mandatory work from home. In that environment, people are being told to go and work from home and very little attention is being given to what is your work environment. There is a human resources disaster in the making because if people are using laptops and they're sitting on their couches, they're going to end up with spinal problems. If they're used to working at standing desks or they've started that sort of process and now you're working at a kitchen table, there are physical issues. There's also lighting issues at play. There's electrical appliance issues that, that, that will cause problems. So we are, I am expecting that the second part of this ramification is that people won't have the discipline about setting up, this is my work area, and it is separate from when I'm going to be watching Netflix, and it is separate from when I'm going to be doing all these other things. It might be in the same room, but it still needs to be a dedicated area because you need that break between work and non-work, work and my other life. And even that is challenging, isn't yeah. it? Because yeah. I know for us, you know, we have four of us at home at the moment mm. and our house isn't big enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have one dining table that is serving currently as an office for two people plus the dining table, you know, with yes. kids running in and out and, and general chaos. Uh, yes, uh, I think the, throwing the kids in the mix in this one is, is even harder. Incidentally, I spent three years homeschooling and working from home. My son needed some additional detention uh, while also doing my, <laughs> my doctoral thesis. So it is possible to balance these things. But the discipline that you have internally needs to also be pushed out to everybody else. You need to have, again, going back to this word of discipline, you need to tell people during this time, you cannot contact me. And not in a nasty way. It's not even in a negotiated way. This is work. So you need to separate those. Now, in reality, that's I, I don't pretend that that's ever going to be perfect, but it is a habit of thinking that you need to get into. I am concerned because with the a lot of people, they, they make that demarcation between work and non-work, uh, at least they used to in the past, it's breaking down a bit, by going to work physically picking up and moving and uh i think though with the, the the coming generation who are more connected with emails and social things like microsoft teams and other products like that that's breaking down a little bit but they still feel that they're at home and they're doing a little bit extra as opposed to i'm doing work and those are two very different things so discipline is the number one thing. Build up those habits. There's plenty of books on building up habits. I know you've talked about it, so that's mm -hmm. the number one thing. The other issue which I, I am concerned with, and it relates back to the physical workspace, is health. 
Now, there's there's two aspects of that. Uh, they're deeply connected, mental health and physical health. When people first start working from home, and we are seeing this, they're not sleeping correctly. They're worried. They're worried not just about the virus. They're actually worried about, am I still going to have a job? What happens when no longer I'm in the visibility of all of my colleagues? So how am I going to be evaluated? So in some of the documents that we've been pushing out to our clients now, it's make sure you explain how things such as performance reviews will happen in this new mode. Social isolation is a real thing, and I think that's very – it's becoming present even within a week. You've got people who are getting, I wouldn't say depressed. If they're liable for depression, it's certainly showing up. If there's any other underlining factors there, they're being heightened by the anxiety. So you need to have mental health awareness of yourself. I am advising companies to bring on counsellors, for example, and have them on standby. Because if you want your staff to be productive in a home environment, you can't have them becoming mentally unhealthy and distracted. And, you know, that's on a pure human capital point of view. But from an ethical point of view, I think you also need to do it. So there's an economic reason and a, <laughs> and a philosophical reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, not every company can handle that at the moment, but those are issues that you need to look at. Now, on the physical health side of things, light. A lot of people don't recognize that in many institutions and in many corporate workspaces, lighting is carefully considered, or at least it should be. Light has a massive impact on your sleep patterns, which has a massive impact on your productivity, your mental health, and a whole range of other things, and your physical health. We're getting reports. It's too early to tell now, but we are getting reports that sleep patterns are are not good for the people who are being asked to work from home. I try very hard to make sure that my sleep patterns and my light patterns, including going out to the work on the balcony whenever the sun is good, making sure I'm getting enough vitamin D, all of these things are deeply interconnected. I talked about sitting down, sit standing desks or whatever it is that does it for you. But for goodness sake, if you are going to be sitting, invest in a good ergonomic chair. And I know these sound really obvious, but people aren't doing them because where do you put an ergonomic chair in a small flat? You're sitting at a dining table. That's not good for you in the long run. You do five years of that and you're going to end up looking like me. <laughs> a total wreck. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some of the issues which I think we need to be dealing with right now as we push you know, almost 80% of our workforce into a homework environment. Yeah. And all sorts of things are just popping into my mind as you're describing those things, because things, I guess, maybe, as I said before, I take for granted, but also things I hadn't considered. Mm -hmm. And that discipline around, certainly from a mental health point of view, that discipline around even structure to your day. Mm -hmm. I know I had one of my first days for a while because I moved into a co-working space about 12 months or so ago, which I have loved for some of the reasons you've described. I have this clear delineation between Mm. I finish with my home responsibilities. I consciously choose to walk most days if the weather's amenable. It's about a 35-minute walk because that gets my bit of incidental exercise in and gives me the fresh air and what have you. Indeed. And then I'm here and I say here because I am actually here in the co-working space at the moment, and I do my work. And it was something that I'd never really thought about, but I actually started to notice quite quickly that when I left and I choose the stairs rather than the lift, and as I walked Mm -hmm. down the stairs, it was like my brain switched to a different mode. It said, right, Mm. work's over, think about what needs to be done, Mm. um, you know, in terms of dinner and children and after school activities and and what have you. So all of those kind of environmental signals that we get when we move from one location to another that triggers the way we think and the benefits to it of doing that. And I stayed at home for the first time in ages and worked from home uh, last Friday and I felt like a blob. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, look, that, that's a really interesting one. So my, my wife is a total gym rat, and, of course, she can't go to the gym. I always would get out of the house. So I actually have set up a separate room in the house as an office. And when I close that door, I am no longer at work. So I, I'm already, you know, physically creating that break. But I would always try and get outside at least for 30 minutes a day, if not longer. Now, can't go to the gym now. So we are making time in the morning, very early in the morning to get up or late in the evening to go out for, you know, our 10,000 step walk. That physical aspect of health is something uh, which, again, probably I haven't paid enough attention to. 
but you know, you hear this term going stir ca- crazy or cabin fever. It's very real. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now, in self-isolation, you need to find other ways of doing that. And um, where we're living at the moment, there is a increasingly heightened concerns. So we are slowly gearing up personally to make the assumption that we won't be able to go and do those early morning walks. There will be a total mm. lockdown. Let's say that happens. This is prepping for the future. And it is happening already. I know some of our listeners mm. that will be overseas and I have a colleague yes. who's currently in Spain. She's on about day 12 or something of four ah. of them in a small apartment. She and her husband both working and mm. two young children. Mm. And I spoke to her last week and, you know, she's a psychologist. She knows this stuff, but she, you know, she was feeling the effects already. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, some of the things that I've been looking at doing are okay i have to find a way of getting out of my skin physically you know getting that energy so let's look at yoga programs on youtube they're great yoga podcasts i'm terrible at yoga by the way i'm I'm a stiff old grumpy guy but we have to do something different so there are things that when we're when we're working from home in this instant that are very different from what it was two months ago and i think we're still navigating that i do believe that companies have a role in consistently updating that information to their workforce, giving them suggestions on what to do. The other area, actually, there's some real opportunities about what's happening at the moment. One of those is that you can reskill yourself. And I think this is another element that can keep you sane. (laughs) Things like Udemy, which is an online training program. There's also Mm. plenty of training courses around there. Uh, I'm teaching myself uh, digital music making. Incidentally, I started that doing that actually before the COVID virus, just as I always try and do at least three pieces of learning a week that are, out, that are not related to my work. But now I'm going to accelerate that. So I suspect you probably would have more information on this, but I suspect that learning new stuff, explicitly carving out time of your day to learn new stuff, the reality is many people are going to be saving two hours a day in travel and commute and all the rest of the stuff that goes around that. Well, what a great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and that is actually one, and ordinarily, and I hadn't actually started to think this through, even though I've been fully immersed in talking to a lot of my clients about all of the well-being things that we need to take into consideration at the moment. One of the ones that I often talk about is the benefits to our well-being of engaging in our hobbies, mm. because that's where we tend to find what we call flow, that experience of being fully engaged in something. It's that learning uh-huh. something new that kind of stretches us to that learning point, but doesn't overstretch us to the point of anxiety anxiety and it's a really you know very beneficial therapeutic place to be and yeah you know to be able to take and and a lot of people those hobbies do involve being outdoors or being you know Mm. somewhere else perhaps but starting to think then as part of your well-being strategy while you are based at home about you know well what are the things that I could do yeah that perhaps I've always wanted to learn or, uh, mm. you know, whether it's I've, I've seen a few people starting to teach themselves guitar and, <laughs> you know, do those things that we can do to maintain that as a mm. conscious strategy. Yeah, and, and I think that is going to be part of this mix. As I said, it's different from what I would have been talking about a couple of months ago and working from home because we are dealing with, with a much higher level of isolation. On that issue about hobbies, that's a very, very big one for me because my hobbies are tabletop gaming. And dinner parties. I would go out and cook for people and we would play, ironically, Pandemic is one of our favourite games, <laughs> not so much about. <laughs> but the challenge is you can't, well, you in the past it would be very difficult to do that. And we're trying to bring in much more of this connection online. I will say, though, that human beings, even with the deep connection that we've got through video conferencing like we're doing now, there's something that's very human about getting face-to-face, uh, sharing you know, a wine or a lovely meal with somebody, uh, and having that conversation just wander. Now, I do know that I've seen uh, some people who actually do hold online dinner parties. I'm not convinced it, it gives the same depth of whatever this thing is that the human brain craves, this, this connectivity. I have concerns to see if that's really going to fill the void. The other interesting thing, though, while I was looking at that, was neurodiversity. So if we look at people who are either on an autism spectrum or there's many, many other different neurologies out there, some of them really like what, you know, they like this consistency of the homework which they can build around themselves. And I'd have to say I'm probably somewhere in that line. <laughs> I'm certainly not on the spectrum. I've had that tested. But no, you know, I, I, I'm what they call uh, trait-focused. But 
we've got to be careful about making some assumptions that this is one size fits all. But this need for connectivity, the self-isolation thing is something I don't think anyone's really got their head around Mm. in this type of environment. This has never happened in human history quite like this. And that's a really excellent point too, because I know I have a sister who is infinitely more extroverted than I am, and mm. her husband is also extroverted. Their children, you know, they are a family of extroverts, and they spend a lot of their time socialising with neighbours, with friends. You know, they have this wonderful, very engaged social life. And she sent me a photo on the weekend of you know the extroverts trying to cope with social distancing, and so they're all still together. They just kind of moved further apart. They've gone to the park, so they're outdoors and they'd move further yeah. apart. And it, it really <laughs> struck me that for my family, where we tend to be at the more introverted end of the spectrum, except perhaps for my older son, you know, this isn't that big of a stretch in terms of reducing some of our social contact. It, it's not great, but it's perhaps not. And it's funny that you mentioned that about the neurodiversity and even just what I would call personality difference, because my younger son is in his element right now. He just thinks it's fantastic. Everyone's home. He loves being home. He can stay in his pajamas, which I'm allowing for the moment. <laughs> oh, 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 that's actually one of those other disciplines, dress for the job. <laughs> it is, I know, but I figure, you know, first day and he's, he's at, although I did, I actually have just been for, I took them out for an hour and a half walking and exploring some of our local areas. So he had to get dressed for that, but that is his happy place. You know, if he got to do hmm. that all day, every day, he would love that. My older son, who's far more social and is a physically much more active child, is already starting to wail around the house, you know, lamenting the fact that he can't be outdoors and catching up with his mates and kicking the football and playing basketball. And so there's a huge amount of individual difference there Mm. that is going to suit some of us and not so much others, isn't there? Yeah, the social isolation aspect of this iteration of working from home, I do see it as a moving experiment in a way. It's a great social experiment which is happening. Mm. I do believe, however, there are things that I'm going to bring it back to the company. What can companies do to help or what can we do within our company environment? So uh, video conferencing, I think, is hugely beneficial and showing people how to set that up. And then when is it appropriate? So, for example, there was one technology company that last Friday had a Friday night drink and they had, I think it was 50-something people online all drinking, you know, that Friday night drink in the office. They were replicating that online. And at first, my first response to that was, geez, that's a great idea. And they went, hang on. (laughs) <laughs> There's going to be at least a portion of that group who really should not be drinking by themselves. Yeah. Whether or not they are alcoholics or not, they're under stress, they're under anxiety, they're feeling isolated. This is not a good thing to do. And there's just from an OCK health and safety point of view there as well, isn't it? Yes, just both in terms of psychological yeah. health, but even in terms of physical health. You know, if someone goes out and injures themselves, is this a work sanctioned event? Is this played a part or not? Absolutely, it will be. I've been actually rewriting some work from home policy documents. We're trying to create one which is a template so that people can just go, I want this, 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 and this. Because none of the work from home policy templates that I've ever seen before have a mandated work from home. Never been done. Mm. Uh, They all have these great checklists on, you know, how to check your workspace and it's going to be signed off by your manager so that you can be approved to work from home. No, that's where they're throwing people under the couch and saying, (laughs) there will be court cases, there will be union actions. And they will be justified in some cases because some of this is happening a little too fast. Now, I get that the risk of having people in these office spaces is far higher than the risk of them breaking a leg. Mind you, I wouldn't want to break a leg and have to go to a hospital in Italy right now. And these are real things that we need to think about work from home. It's sort of amusing for me because I'm actually a prepper. You know, you you see these shows about, you know, preppers. And because I've lived in countries where sometimes the electricity supply was never reliable, I always would keep two weeks of food and emergency supplies and a big first aid kit on hand. That's as much prepping as I'm going to do. I'm not going to build a fallout shelter or anything silly like that. Anything more than two weeks, we've got a real problem. So when all of this came up, I didn't need to go out and buy lots of canned goods or anything. I was set. But the home office has a full first aid kit because especially in this environment. If you fall down or you damage yourself and you're at work, somebody would be there to take care of you. In this environment, you're going to a hospital and it's possible that during a pandemic, that's the last place you want to be. So these are my more extreme, darker sides from my prepper mentality coming through. (laughs) I joked to my wife yesterday, I've been waiting my whole life for this. No, it's not true. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's not true at all. But, you know, there are scenarios which the HR departments of organisations have had very little say on. If you go and talk to an HR professional, they know all this stuff, but they're having to move so fast to avert another risk, which is likely to be higher than these risks. There's only so many hours in the day, isn't there, at the moment? There's only so many risks that you can deal with. Yeah. It's literally that issue. It's the trolley problem. Do you accept this risk, which is going to, given the population, going to hurt some people, or this risk, which is going to hurt other people, but maybe a larger number or a small number? These are tough. You know, if you were really, really a top-level person in an HR department, and uh, despite the fact that you're having to make decisions on letting people go and all of those things, you've got all these other things to cope with. And again, I worry about their mental health. This is going to be hard, deeply emotional decisions to make. Mm. And I think too, uh, just the burden of the volume mm, of yes. things that need attending to at the moment, the, the constant change, I'm wondering whether or not a lot of, you know, a lot of our leaders are perhaps not really getting any sleep, let alone adequate sleep for their well-being and mental health. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And by the way, your leaders could be your mum and dads. It could be, you know, that goes all the way down the line. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly been a topic that I've been speaking about with a number of organisations and clients over over the webinars <laughs> in the last few days, just those basics of reminding ourselves to breathe, that deep belly breathing for relaxation and stress reduction, the importance of sleep, the importance of movement, a lot of the topics that you've mentioned already mm. from the point of view of managing the anxiety and the stress. Mm, but obviously now we're overlaying that with the requirements given a different working set up for mm. people. One of the things that we haven't touched on, well, we've sort of introduced, but we haven't gone into any kind of depth yet, Joe, is this combination, and you mentioned before that you have experience of both working and homeschooling. Mm. So for many of us, we are now not only dealing with trying to work from home and some of the challenges that you've suggested or introduced there, but we're doing it and also trying to either occupy or school children at home at the same time do you have tips or advice or even just ideas around that yeah i could trivially say hey there's plenty of stuff online there's great lesson plans online you can go and find them your schools will be able to help you there is stuff that you can do that however is not a fair thing to, for me to say because while it's true the re reality is that educating a child is it's a science it's brain surgery and when I was homeschooling my son, I was in the middle of my education thesis. So I know how to educate. And I was doing it at a time, yeah, you know, things were very, very, you know, very high pressure time for me at that period, both in the home life. I was, I was effectively being a single parent for a while. But I knew what worked from a practical and scientific. You know, I had all of that education background. I had university education degrees behind me, so I could do that stuff. I also would reach out to a huge, there's a huge uh, homeschooling community globally. It varies greatly from people who are doing it for religious reasons to people who are doing it for political reasons to other people who just think it gives a better outcome. Incidentally, Statistically, it does, but there's there's other downsides of it. And the reason why it does is because you've got much more one-on-one -on -one time with the student. You know, we know that that has a, has a positive effect. So here's the, here's the rub. I'd like to say this is going to be easy. I'd like to say that there's lots of resources out there that you can use. But the reality is this is not going to work for a lot of parents. And simply resorting to saying, hey, do all of your lessons online, I can tell you because my whole research thesis was on the use of technology in education, it won't work. It doesn't give the deep education, what we call the variance that you want to see happening, the forward movement of education. That requires humans. That requires humans interacting. So what do you do? Well, I've got a policy, uh, a workplace policy in front of me that I'm reviewing that explicitly says uh, having your children home is not an excuse for not meeting your work demands. I'm sorry, businesses are just going to have to realise it is going to need to be an excuse. Mm. Businesses cannot afford, in the current environment, to ignore the role of the child in this environment, in the workplace, because that's what's happened. So I think that there is a 
an issue beyond just saying what do parents do to saying what does the organisation do. I'm going to go and fight that war <laughs> later today. I have to say to them, you, you can't do this because, it, one, it won't work for the child, two, it won't work for the parent, and three, you're just going to end up creating a really bad society. <laughs> it's just going to mess. Everything is going to go wrong. Yeah. So businesses do need to be part of this discussion. The other part of it then is, okay, what can the parent do? From my research into literacy development and educational progress and so forth, and I remember I went into that research thinking technology was good and would help education. What I discovered is the number one thing that you can do is feed your children. <laughs> so nutrition is really important during this period. Love your children. That's the second one. And then read to your children. And the interesting thing is that you only need to read to, if you've got a young child, I'm saying basically seven down, uh, from the age of zero, <laughs> all the way up to seven, read to them three times a day, about 10 to 20 minutes a day. That alone has a massive impact on educational outcomes. And uh, that, that's that literacy development. For older children, do look to the online resources and do look to the homeschool resources because there are wonderful, very inexpensive, if not free, education programs that you can pull down. Uh, what I mean by programs is printable documents and things. Don't try and do this all online. Please go and get yourself a printer. Education is as much about that handwriting because that has a different cognitive process to typing on a keyboard. For older children, one of the things I would be doing with the older children, I'm talking now teenagers and their, uh, I'd say, you know, years nine and up, let them decide what they're going to learn and let them create their own learning communities. They're old enough, they're wise enough, uh, almost, <laughs> they're smart enough to go out there and find. But you need to have them report back to you. So flip the learning on its head. Now, the schools will be working with you on that, but if your son or daughter has a particular interest, for example, my son had a fascinating interest in mathematics and particularly in three-dimensional mathematics. So he was watching the maths of glass blowing. There's a professor in Europe who specializes in this. And he would just watch all the YouTube channels that this guy put forward. Now, are they producing content back to you to evaluate? No. During this period of time, I think we have to assume that assessment is going to be really, really broken. But that's no excuse for not having your kid at the end of the day over dinner report back to you what they learned today hmm. and blow you away with the some of the stuff which is, you know, university. It's absolutely quite possible that in this day and age, the students will be looking, your kids will be looking at university level discussions, but it will be all over the place. So the advice is for the younger children, read, read, read to them. Take the time to read to them. Yes, do some maths, do some books like that, but honestly, that is stuff which is going to be hard for a parent to deploy at a level that really makes a deep, deep difference. Now, if you've got an education background, go for it. If not, lean upon those homeschool environments and whatever else the government puts out. For these slightly older children, the schools will probably be able to help pick up some of that slack, and I do see some good incentives there. And for the older kids, the kids who are you know, adopt a self-learning model and then have them report back to you, but forget about assessment. I just can't see it happening adequately. I did say that certainly here at, uh, well, no, it must be national, the NAPLAN mm. was cancelled for yes, <laughs> this year. So that assessment's gone. Yes. <laughs> my my grade six, I didn't care, but my grade three was about to have his first experience of that. So. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, that point about assessment, I know, you know, for a lot of parents, there is still a lot of, I suppose, focus on outcomes and the measurement of outcomes and that's fair enough. I guess what I'm perhaps hearing is that if we, you know, we, we've got a bit of permission maybe just to let that go, or we should be giving ourselves a little bit of permission to let that go and instead let the kids kind of follow their curiosity. Yes, it's, it's sort of what I'm saying. I, what I'm trying to be as practical as possible. So as an educator, when the child is at a point of where they can be a self-learner, and this generation definitely are self-learners, Harness that, but don't pretend as a parent that you're going to have the time to do detailed assessment and do the level of detail that a high school teacher and all of the support network that goes with that is going to give. Unless you are already a homeschooler and you have geared yourself up for that and you've taken the financial hit of giving up a lot of work time to do that, it's just not going to happen. And I don't want to see parents stressing themselves out to a point of where they're angry and resentful of their children and vice versa. These are real outcomes if we don't, you know, give ourselves some freedom. The other point is that 
we do know that one of the what we call one of the quality teaching models there's a there's a number of factors in quality teaching models and this is 45 years worth of data that we know what works well for education self learning self directed learning is a quality teaching model now in a school environment a really good teacher would give out assignments saying okay you know we're going to be studying the civil war today go and figure out what it is you're going to present about the civil war there, there may be say, some questions and then the students would go out and they'd make it real to their life maybe some of them would go and get politically active uh maybe some of them would look at indigenous issues or whatever and then the, it's the teacher's role to try and figure out how to assess all of those things equally mm -hmm. and there are models for doing that assessment and so forth parents i'm sorry you're not going to have the time to do that but you can still get the best part of that issue, which is the self-directed learning. So for the old students, I really encourage parents to sit down with their kids and say, what do you want to learn? What fascinates you? Part of that prepares them for their career. So, for example, my daughter was very interested in animation. So she actually left high school for some years, went off and did a postgrad course, came back on animation. And then after she, she got an amazing mark and then she went off and went to after. So if you give children self-directed learning opportunities and they're deeply passionate and they are self-learners, you're going to go great. It's also going to take a lot of pressure off the parents and it'll become a joyous experience, not an experience of I'm not being a good parent because I don't know how to be a teacher because I haven't done four years at university education learning brain surgery because that's what education is. It's brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> or I just don't have time. And and I'm wondering too, because I mean, we started out talking about the discipline of working from home and the need for some structure, both in terms of productivity, but possibly even more so in terms of mm -hmm. mental health. How do we then fit that in? Or given that there's this additional requirement mm. of helping our kids to learn, even if they're doing that in a more self-directed way than they might have otherwise. Yeah, so I think the process I put forward is probably the only way that I can see this actually having any chance of working. I'm not pretending this is going to be easy. It is going to be very tough. One of my colleagues coined a term yesterday when we were discussing similar issues to this. He said, everyone's going to be on degraded performance. Companies just have to realise they're not going to be able to get all the stuff done that they wanted to get done. The complete collapse of Centrelink uh, yesterday is a good example of degraded performance. The fact that hospitals may get overwhelmed is an example of degraded performance. And this cuts all the way down to the home life. So I think the thing that we need to do in order to remain sane is just assume that everything around us is going to be degraded performance. Now, there are opportunities in this as well. So my work environment, I've had probably two weeks worth of meetings in total, not just elapsed time, but that much time over the next six months, completely wiped off my schedule, just gone. So in some ways, I've got some time back. Now, I'm lucky both my kids are adults and so forth, but I now need to turn that into other productive work. And so I know that I'm going to be under greater performance. I know that a lot of my contacts just can't deal with me the way that they used to. And that's across everybody. So people can look at this one of two ways. They can either get really anxious and try and fix it, or they can say, this is what's happening. I have to figure out what do I do differently in this environment? And again, organizations have a role to take to give people permission to find new ways of working, but they also have a role to expose what is working for other people. And we were talking before, this is not going to be one size fits all model. This is truly a great human experiment that's being thrust upon us. Yeah. And that, well, I, I'm a big fan of an experiment and a testing and learning. Not on I people. think you're right. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, I, I talk a lot about that kind of self-experimentation, you know, just oh, try right. new things, see what works for you and what doesn't, do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Mm. You know, in a way, yes, we're, we're just as a society kind of coming to grips with that right now in a number of different domains on a larger scale. Part of the, well, my understanding is part of the work that you're doing is helping organisations to come up with these sorts of policies to be able to understand what are the issues and how can you start setting about working through them. Mm. Is that, because as you say, you know, this is all very new in terms of it's a, a different paradigm. We've moved from that largely volunteer-based work from home to the, the requirement for 
a lot of people to have to work from home. And I know, you know, my husband's organization, there was just a CEO edict that said everybody must work from home. So yep. there was not even any other choice in That's that what's happening. Yep. anymore. <laughs> yep. So, you know, are there presently resources out there or are we really collating these on the fly? I think it's a bit of both. So, look, there's a lot of things that we do absolutely know that work. Incidentally, there's one thing that I should have mentioned. You, you talked about self-improvement, you know, constantly self. Something I would strongly recommend all of your listeners to advocate is have a handwritten diary uh, in the morning and you write out the things that you're going to try and achieve. Uh, I actually do it in two phases. I mean, this is something which has been around for, what, 60 years. But having an online diary and having all these team collaboration tools is incredibly powerful, wonderful. But the cognitive benefit, the emotional benefit of sitting down in the morning with a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it else is you want, not alcohol, please, uh, and writing down your day saying, today I'm going to do this. And not a lot of things, no more than three. Rewriting down what meetings you've got. Thinking about, uh, I actually, every morning I, I have a think of what am I grateful for in life? Sometimes I don't write it. I only need to do one of them a week, but at least have a think about it. I also have a three-month game plan. Now, interestingly, I've thrown it out the door. This weekend, I was actually mm. complaining to my wife, I don't know what my objectives are. I've always got a big objective every three months. I have none of them at the moment because I just do not know what the future is. And I have to tell you, it's scaring me to hell. You know, It's really like, oh, my God, and I'm the prepper. <laughs> that was something that surprised me. But doing this morning ritual or an evening ritual, whenever you want to do it, for about half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour, whether it's with a, a pandemic or not, that self-reflection and that self-organization is hugely beneficial when you are working in a semi-isolated mode because it makes you figure out what works for you and what doesn't. I actually do uh, quite occasionally right at the end of the day things I learned today and, mm. and I try and act upon them. I try and develop new habits. So that's hugely useful. But coming back then to the you know to the broader issue that of you know treating this as a as a main experiment, I would be very cautious again about people trying to think that they're going to be able to deliver everything they delivered before. There yeah. are some things that just aren't going to work. There's another thing which I have seen which really concerns me, and it's a personal concern. I've got a couple of friends who can't work from home. They're working in service areas that are you know they're mission critical. And their partners are at home and their partners are scared that their spouse is going to bring something home and the kids are going to get it. So you've got these tensions brewing as well. These are, these are other issues which, honestly, I don't know how to deal with. Mm. Maybe that's our domain as psychologists. Yes. <laughs> Mine yes. and my colleagues. You know, the, this is a whole new world and certainly in terms of all of those things that you've mentioned, cognitive capacity. I think when you're talking about degraded performance before, one of the things that I'm really noticing right now is that people just don't have the attention even to get a lot of the basic things done. Our minds are so distracted by the constant change, by the anxiety. Mm. I myself have had to give myself permission to say, you know what, it's okay if you only get a fraction of what you thought you were going to get done today. These are abnormal circumstances. Brains are just distracted. The, the heightened emotion, the heightened conversation, it's hard. And that mm. self-permission in there. And, again, you know, I think that extends, as you say, to organisations to be able to give themselves permission or just an acknowledgement mm. that this ain't the same world. No, <laughs> it's no. just not going to keep happening in the same way. Yeah, I, I think, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a, an optimistic sort of guy. I'm actually very Socratic. I, I, I tend to look at the world and I go, I use what I call stoic absurdism. <laughs> so go, <laughs> what's the absolute worst thing that can happen with this disease? Uh, and then I have fun with it. And that makes a lot of my anxiety go away. That's a personal little trick I use. But one of the other things, which I think is a little bit deeper, and again, it won't work for everybody, but I, if you are listening in, I, I would recommend you at least try it, is it's an opportunity for you to reinvent yourself, to reinvent the world that you have around you. So for me, I'm going to learn how to be a DJ. Now, ridiculous. My, my DJ name <laughs> is going to be Polka Doc, because I'm going to make the world only polka DJ music because it's the worst possible thing I could think of. You know? And there's that absurdist <laughs> coming through. Yep. But the other thing that I'm, I'm using this as an opportunity for is to completely reinvent the way that our company delivers its materials and what we deliver to our clients, how we deliver and what we deliver. And, of course, everyone at the moment is totally receptive to this. My goal, I don't want to have to travel interstate anymore. 
I don't want to have to travel overseas. Mm. I do lots of travel. I don't want to do it. So there are some opportunities that you can draw from this, whether it's reinventing your company, reinventing yourself, reinventing your relationships. There are opportunities here. And my gut feel, you're the psychologist, my gut feel is that in situations where people feel like they have no control, and we don't, we don't have control over the situation, doing anything to give ourselves agency, to give ourselves control back again is incredibly powerful. That's why we go and buy lots of toilet paper. That's why we go and buy mints. By the way, mints, one of the worst things you can possibly buy for stockpiling. Don't do it, people. <laughs> I'm a prepper. That's the, Don't do that. The prepper's Don't, advice. <laughs> Don't do this. Get yourself a 26-litre canning system and, and be prepared that way. <laughs> yes, I've got one of those. <laughs> but I think one of the other ways that at least I'm giving myself agency is I'm saying I'm going to reinvent a few things that I've been wanting to do for ages. What's worrying me is I, I don't actually have an outcome, that three-month big goal. And I've always worked towards those big goals. And I feel rudderless. And that is a source of my anxiety. And I, I suspect there'll be other people who have that as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I know for last week's episode, I actually talked a bit about that need for control, the way it's manifesting. So yes, as you say, the toilet paper purchase, the the stockpiling, some of the other behaviours that we've seen and using that model of, of what we call the circle of concern and the circle of influence. So those things in the circle of concern, the outer circle, which are the things that affect us but we can do nothing about them, and then trying to refocus on the things in that inner circle, which is that circle of influence, the things that we can do something about. So that self-development, if it's pivoting your work or your business or if you say you know, it's using it as opportunity to learn about anything, you know, yourself, the work you do, your relationships, how your family functions, your self-care and your well-being, you know, actually starting to pay attention to say, okay, well, I know that if I just sit here all day working at my dining room table, I start to feel really irritated <laughs> and anxious. You know, what do I need to do to lessen that? Let's try a few different things and see what works. Do I go for a work, walk early morning? Do I do an online yoga class? Do I spend more time whatever it might be, because that is all in that inner circle. Yeah. So from my point of view, do you think that the sort of things that you're talking about there need to be very explicitly stated by organizations and that they need to give their staff this type of training? And that's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, you're asking the psychologist, but yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think, I mean, this is what I do. This is what my colleagues do, especially those of us who work in positive psychology. Well, before any of this happened, mm. we're looking at what we know. And you mentioned the gratitude before, you know, a really well-researched practice in positive psychology where we are starting to learn. It's a relatively new field, only 20 years now what helps people to thrive and flourish. And, you know, we could say, oh, well, that's not what it's about right now. Now it's just survival. But no, you know, these are the tools that help us to remain resilient, that help us to thrive and flourish in the everyday so that we're better placed to deal with the stressful, the new, the uncertain, the anxious and, and all of the change. So there's a number of us now working in these fields and trying to get this message out to organisations. I'm hoping that maybe, you know, when we think about where the opportunities lie, maybe this is the opportunity to actually get this message a little further embedded in our workplaces. That's my passion. I, when Martin Seligman first started talking about positive psychology, his vision was to be able to implement these strategies, these practices in our institutions. So through our community, through our education system and through our workplaces. So my bag is the workplace thing. Yeah, my, my gut feel is telling me from what I'm seeing at the rate of change and the rate of stress inside organisations both in the technology departments and the HR departments? Because at the moment, a lot of people are viewing this as a, as a tech problem. It's not. It's, yeah. it's a human resourcing problem. People problem. I actually think that organisations that don't start to look at these issues are not going to come out of the coming recession, because that's the second part of this. There's an economic downturn which is going to hit. I think organisations that don't get this have got very little chance of coming out this well. I think organisations that do implement this much more uh, holistic approach to human capital to staff. Uh, in other words, they start focusing on the human, not the capital part of that. My gut feel is that they're going to come out much better. And also they'll come out with a lot less uh, governance investment and technology investment, all the rest of it. There's a lot of things that people are really good at and they're actually all the skills that companies being, you know, everyone talks about digital transformation. Well, let's talk about human transformation. And I think 
I believe very strongly that there is a dire need and this is a turning point for this. Now, what that does to the economy, how that changes employment contracts, how that changes the way that we use technology to collaborate, those are all up in the air. Those will be discovered as we go. But I, I do think some hard action needs to take place in this space. So you're going to be in far more demand than me. Well, <laughs> I see it as an opportunity. There's collaborative opportunities there because, as you say, you know, there's, there's all of that stuff that has to fall out of that. We can start with people first. And obviously, I'm an advocate of that. And I think, as you say, you know, for me as a psychologist, despite the trauma, despite the challenge, despite the fact that this is just so disruptive and, and so worrying for so many people, I personally do believe also that this is an opportunity for transformation for us as communities, as workplaces, as people as a society. I think this is forcing us to slow down. It's forcing us to relook at our priorities. It's, it's forcing us to understand ourselves and our reactions a little more. And, and I think they are all good things. I'm sorry. I'm sad that it's had to be such a calamitous thing that has led to this, but uh -huh. we take what we're given and we'll deal with it <laughs> as best we can. So, yeah, I think there are absolutely opportunities here. And I just wanted to finish, Joe, by asking, in terms of that, what are some of the opportunities now for, if we come back even just to that simple work from home, well, I say simple, it's not simple at all, but the work from home question, you know, where do you see this going? Because it's like we've taken the world and uh, shaken it up and thrown it up in the air to let it land. Where do you think this will lead us? Um, I'm internal optimist, so I, I generally believe that we will come out of this as a, stronger as a, as a global culture. There are other huge issues heading our way, technological issues, workforce issues, all sorts of AI. There's all this stuff. There's other disruptions other than this biological one heading our way that we need to deal with. So, you know, if you want to go through the pain in a sharp period of time, this is one way to do it. So there's that. You know, this is a hard learning experience and it is going to be brutal. Uh, it is brutal. The other thing, though, uh, you know, I want to get down to a personal level. I do believe that the role of the child in the economy, the role of education in the economy, has been viewed for too long as prepping people for work, as opposed to prepping people for the challenges ahead. Very different things. Very different. Uh, now, educators have always been wanting to prep the child for, you know, whatever challenges they face. But now that's coming into the home. And we talked a little bit about how do you deal with that as a parent, but there's actually real advantages here. I do believe that there's a lot of benefits to moving our children towards develop that great literacy skill set by being read to, by having nursery rhymes, by doing all that sort of stuff. Play games. Educators at the middle tier will really be needed and they can double down on that. And they are. Uh, I think there's a great deal of we're going to see an education system which is far more fluid and reactive to the needs of the of the students rather than the needs of the education i know that most educators actually wanted that but now there's a fundamental shift happening that's forcing education in this space and then for the older students you know if we do let them start to use this incredible information engine that we've got didn't exist when i was at well didn't really exist when i was a lad i grew up through the birth of that literally you're going to have kids accelerating their types of learning and areas that they want to learn far, far faster than anything else. And, they, and it's going to make them better learners. It's going to make them happier. And I think overall that that generation coming through will be much better problem solvers, much more resilient because they've had to be. They've learned that earlier in life. I think that if their parents can demonstrate these disciplines of work and life and focus, that the children will take that on. So I think there's huge benefits to the society in the long run. Again, I am the eternal optimist. <laughs> As am I. Yeah. And of course, you know, we, we do have to be realistic. There are some very real detrimental effects from this. Our economy is going to be down. There's going to be a lot of people unemployed. No one's talking about refugees at the moment because once this virus gets into those camps and is already starting to, we're going to see a totally different refugee crisis and it's going to sweep borders. There's so many other big challenges that are just across the horizon. And they're so big that I don't think governments alone can deal with this. And I don't think that companies alone can deal with this. I think that we will see, I'm hoping that we will see much more of a blending. And when you look at the sort of donations and the, uh, the fact that certain companies are just giving huge resources or reallocating staff to some of these big issues, I'm actually hopeful. I think maybe we will see a very different culture start to emerge from this. 
and maybe it's the right sort of culture we need to meet these other huge challenges coming our way. That's a lovely way to finish on that hopeful note because I've been talking about psychological hope recently as a vehicle for both dealing with the uncertainty but, as you say, you know, emerging stronger as a result. And I think despite perhaps our optimistic tendencies, I think if we take that step back and have a look at that bigger picture, this is what we're facing right now. And and that gives us a lot more power to view it that way. So I really, really appreciate your insights, everything that you've offered us today from the practicalities of work from home policy through to the insights into how children learn and absolutely everything in between. It's been a fantastic conversation and I really appreciate your time as do our listeners, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And bless all of you. I really send out a warm message of hope to everybody because it's at a time which is needed. If you're feeling anxious, it's okay. (laughs) Things will pass. (laughs) They will. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me for that interview with Dr. Joe Sweeney. I hope it's given you something to think about as we settle into a life lived more remotely than most of us are used to. If you're facing homeschooling, and work from home and all of the juggle contained within that. I've linked to a few articles that may help in the show notes for today's episode. And Joe also mentioned journaling as one of the tools that he uses to keep his day and his mind straight. And I've found a helpful article on journaling and wellbeing from some of my fellow positive psychology practitioners. So there's a link there to that as well. I am going to dig out my own journal. It's been a while since I've done any journaling, but I think Joe's right. I think this is probably the time for it. You can also find out more, of course, about Joe and the work that he does with IBRS and his social accounts all in the show notes at potential.com.au forward slash podcast. Now, I mentioned in the intro that the team and I will be taking a break for a few weeks while we, or I at least, Andy and Jay are consummate work from home professionals, get settled into a new routine. And while we do that, I have two requests for you. Firstly, if you haven't already, please listen into our past episodes. Today's is episode number 79. So that means there are 78 previous episodes available to listen into with all but a handful being interviews with incredible experts in fields, including positive psychology, neuroscience, parenting, mental health, mindfulness, work and wellbeing, resilience, sleep, and more. And there's a couple of solo episodes that I've done in there too relatively recently. And my second request is please tell me what you'd like to learn more about in our next season of the show. Do you want more content on coping with life during a global pandemic and understanding why we do what we do? Do you need distraction and topics that are unrelated to global pandemics? Would you like more tips and strategies on thriving right now from the positive psychology community or on dealing with a rapidly changing life? Is there something else. Please let me know in the Facebook group or via Instagram or our Facebook page or through the Potential Psychology website, or you can email me directly at ellenjackson at potential.com.au. I'd love you to help me to shape the coming season of the show according to what you need and what you'd like to learn about and hear more about. And please, like last week, if this episode has been in any way helpful to you or you think it could be helpful to others, share it around. I'll post the links on social media as I always do, please share these or share within groups that you're a part of, or you can also share directly from the podcast app on most podcast platforms. Okay, that's it from me for the moment. Please keep in touch via social media channels, or if you're not on my mailing list already, you can sign up at potential.com.au forward slash subscribe, and I'll appear like magic in your inbox at semi-regular or perhaps sporadic intervals. Who knows right now? In the meantime, though, as always, stay safe, look after yourself and your well-being, and do everything that you can to live, learn, flourish and fulfil your potential. <laughs>